How you guys doing? Yeah, awesome. Uh, it's been a great morning other than the chaos that I created in the parking lot over the last few hours. So it's all good. Uh, I went 17 minutes over in the first service and yeah, a lot of the parking people are not happy with me, right? It's great to have you guys excited. I will promise I'll try not to go 17 minutes over in this service because I know you're hungry. Oh, hey, thanks. I appreciate that. Um, but we want to take a moment uh, and we just typically take a first Sunday of the month and uh, talk about defining moments. And so we just like to catch you guys up to speed with that. Defining Moments is a two-year initiative that we started back in December of last year um, to begin to raise funds for, uh, for our uh, building expansion. Um, it's not about the money. It's about the mission that God has called us to as we continue to grow um, as the body of Christ and to grow as a church. We believe believe that this was the next step for us as a church. And so we started that journey. Um, those of you who are giving to that, thank you so much. And we just wanted to give the church family, the church body, an update on where we are. Um, there's information in a booklet that's out on the table if you'd like more information about it. Um, or if you'd like to go to the website, there's also some information there. And you can see pictures and all that kind of fun stuff uh, on, the, on the website. Our goal uh, for the capital campaign and for the initiative was four points. Point six um, million, uh, which would help us in accomplishing the things that we we wanted to accomplish. Uh, we had pledged back in December when we had a pledge. We had two point four that was actually pledged, and you can see that obviously there's a little bit of a gap there. What's really cool in the way that God's been working is that our current giving to this point since we started back in December is one point three. So that's been awesome. We're we're nine months. We're nine months into this, um, and uh, have already seen 1.3 come in. Um, and as projected, if we continue at the giving that we're on right now, we're projected to actually take in 3.6 to 3.8. Um, so that's awesome to see what God continues to do. Um, obviously, you see that there's a gap uh, in there. And so one of the th couple of the things that you can be praying about, one is if you're not a part of Defining Moments, would you consider being a part of Defining Moments? It's not too late, only because we're nine months into it doesn't mean that you can't jump on board. And I encourage you, if you're a part of Crosswinds, do something, even if it's small. Um, or if you're not giving to Crosswinds and you call this your home, um, I would encourage you to start giving to Crosswinds, not because we want something from you, but because we believe that God has something for you. It's Again, it's about the mission that that God has uh, has called us to. And a couple things that you can be praying about is that at the end of this month, uh, we'll actually be applying for a grant through the Lasco Foundation. Um, and last time we applied for that grant, we got like $648,000. So pray for that. Um, we'll be applying for uh, about, a, I think, a, somewhere around a $2 million grant through that. Um, so be praying, uh, praying about that. And then also uh, you can be praying about uh, December's offering. So in this December and then a year of December, we'll be doing a special offering at the end of the year, uh, again, to help us continue to be on mission with what God wants us to. And we'll be taking up a special offering so you can be praying uh, about that uh, as well. Uh, we always like to highlight what God's doing and, and why we continue to move forward with this as part of the mission. And here are some pictures that you see that we utilize this facility to our best that we possibly can. One of the things when we built it, we said that we want to utilize the facility for God's glory and use it in any way that we possibly can. And just about every day out of the week, we have someone or, or evening, we have someone in the facility. Uh, that top right picture and actually the center top picture, you see a bunch of kids. We have a homeschool co-op that meets here on Tuesdays um, for the majority of the day with about a hundred kids. And so it's 
awesome to have them running around. Uh, I mean, if you like screaming kids and you like running around, uh, but it's always good. There's a lot of energy on the, in, in this building on Tuesday mornings um, and Tuesday afternoons. So it's just great to be able to utilize that. You see small groups um, uh, utilize the facility on Wednesday nights. Our teenagers use it. And I get to uh, uh, tell you guys this, that this past Wednesday night, they had their largest attendance ever in the history of Crosswinds Church with 111 teenagers in the building. So how, how awesome is that? Um, and so we want to continue to do everything that we can. A part of this project is building a new sanctuary and then being able to take this, this building and uh, allow our kids, to use, kids and teenagers to use it um, to continue to do ministry uh, moving forward. So we're just really excited uh, about that. We have a couple of other groups that use it, Boys Home, the Boys and Girls Home of North Carolina. They've been using it to do some foster care, um, to do some foster family training for uh, foster families and then also seven homes has been using it they're a foster care organization too that are helping to place kids uh, here in North Carolina um, and so just really uh, excited about that so that's defining moments and if you'd like more information about that you can find it outside or stop one of us and give us a talk to us about it so we're starting a study on Daniel um, I've, as I was praying through this, it started really months ago. I really felt like leading up to these next few months, um, and and what is in front of us with the election and just this year, um, that was really important for us to jump into a book that kind of dealt with that deals with prophecy. Um, and you're going to see that, but there are some really good things that I believe will help us as we continue to move forward in the days ahead. Um, because one of the things that is kind of uh, our, our desire out of this is to gain wisdom in a secular world that seems to be filled with a lot of chaos. Would you guys agree that chaos seems to reign these days? And, and what we know to be true is that the majority of you in here, you actually work in secular, in the secular world. Um, you, you spend a good portion of your days, whether it's at your job or whatever it might be that you're doing, the majority of you um, are, the majority of us, uh, including myself, probably not as much as you. I don't have a secular job that I go to uh, every single day. I mean, these people I hang out with most of the week here, they're pretty decent. And, um, uh, but, but learning to live in faith in a secular world and, and to be able to walk through and navigate the days that we're living in and the society and the culture that we're living in with godly wisdom and with godly faith can actually create its challenges. And, and the thing is, is that that's exactly what Daniel did, had to navigate by being a part, being exiled with the Israelites to the Babylonians, that's exactly what David, Daniel had to do as he navigated these things. Because here's the, here's the truth. It is possible for us to live by faith in a secular world. Let me say that again. It is possible for us as believers, if we claim to be followers of Jesus, if we claim to be disciples of Jesus, it's possible for us to live in the culture that we live in and still live by faith. It doesn't mean that it won't, won't be easy, but it's still God gives us the ability and the courage, and the boldness, and the strength to do it if we will choose to live differently than the world lives. You see, because to make a difference in this life, we have to live differently than the world is li living, okay? That doesn't mean we have to be weird, okay? Because there are plenty of weird Christians. Yeah, I'm serious. There are plenty of weird Christians, and you probably think of one in your head right now. <laughs> Miss Kathy, you're not a weird Christian, I promise you, all right? 
<clears throat> but living differently, that there are some things, and we see that in Daniel's life, that there were some things that he actually did differently, and that if we're going to be followers of Jesus, there's going to be this tension in our lives between living the way the world lives and then living the way God wants us to live. And we're going to bump up against that on a regular basis, especially for the majority of you who live and work in a secular environment, in a secular world. And so let's look at Daniel, Daniel chapter 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's 21 verses, so you guys hang, hang in there with me. If I say a word wrong, you can call me out. That's okay. But Daniel chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the third year of the, of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and did what? Besieged. He besieged it. Okay. So this actually speaks all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, where the Israelites tried to build a tower, the Tower of Babel, um, because they, would, they believed that if they could build a tower that would get them to heaven and closer to God. And essentially what they were doing at the beginning of this was they were setting man up to be the center of the world. Not God, but they were setting man up to be the center of, of everything. That was, that, that was their goal. That was their attempt. And because of, of the Israelites' disobedience in 605 BC, God actually gave them over. He, he kept his promise in that if they were not obe obedient, they did not walk in obedience, then he would exile them. And so in 605 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar comes into the picture, he besieges uh, Jerusalem, and, they, and takes them to Babylon, Babylonia. It says, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Uh, these, uh, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered um, Ashpenaz, chief of his uh, court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language, look, okay, Verse, this, this is really important. He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. So what was he doing? He was indoctrinating them into Babylonian secular culture. That same thing is happening today. Okay? So not, not only was it happening then, but it's happening now. As well, we'll talk a little bit more about that. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, Azariah, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. He didn't like their name. So they gave them... Uh, other names, more like Babylonian type names. And so he called them Belteshazzar, Hananiah became Shadrach, Mishael became Meshach, and Azariah became Abednego. But Daniel, but Daniel resolved not to be, not to defile himself with the royal food and wine and asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now, God had caused the official to show favor and compassion on Daniel. Is God working? Absolutely. He's allowed, the, he's allowed the Israelites to go into captivity, into exile because of their disobedience. But guess who's still there? God is. And he's still showing himself. He's still giving favor to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your, assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. 
Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, he looked healthier and they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food. I bet they didn't like Daniel at this point, right? They had been given royal food and wine to drink. Daniel said, I don't want this. They test him for 10 days and then the, then the guard took it away from the rest of the guys. They were like, oh, I don't like this Daniel guy. Uh, so the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning, and Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the, at the, end of the time set by the king to bring them into his service, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them. He found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King, uh, king Cyrus. Okay, so I want to give you a couple of thoughts for a couple of things about Daniel, uh, the book of Daniel first. This was God's plan because of Israel's disobedience, this was God's plan to fulfill his promise and actually send them into exile. And here's what I want to say about that. God allows bad things to happen to good people. God allows bad things to happen to good people. But what we know is that even when bad things happen, God is still there right? It was because of their disobedience that God said, okay, well, if you're going to be disobedient, then what's going to happen is here are going to be the consequences of your disobedience. Because here's the thing, in our disobedience, there's always consequences. But fortunately, God still loves us because not only do we see God in Daniel allowing the Israelites to be exiled, but he, we also see the redemption of God in Daniel. And actually through the book of Daniel, we see Jesus, it's actually a picture of Jesus and the, it's a prophecy of the coming of Jesus. The other thing is Babylon, Babylon is a parallel. It, it's not a parallel. Babylon is a kingdom that is at war with God. And so it's very, it, it would be parallel to where, how we see the secular world these days. You can compare the secular world that we live in today to, the, to Babylon uh, in the Old Testament, specifically in, in Daniel. Because the kingdom of Babylon is at war against God. Would you say that our secular society is at war against God? Absolutely. If, you're, if you don't believe that, then you're, you've been deceived by the enemy. Um, because we are at war. Uh, our society is at war against God. And this is the way, this is part of the way why I connected back to Genesis chapter 11 and the story of Babel, um, where, the, key, where the, kingdom, uh, the kingdom where man is at the center. And again, we live in a society, uh, we live in a society that's much like that, where people want to be the center of their own life. They want to do their own thing. And so we see this playing out. So what Satan does is Satan uses, the enemy uses similar, a similar strategy to indoctrinate us into secular society. Now, I don't know if you know this, but Daniel was only 15 he, well, he was somewhere between 13 and 17 when this happened. Now, can you imagine being 13, 17, somewhere in there, and you're brought into the king, and you, say, you, the, you tell one of the guards, hey, um, 
I'm sorry, but I can't eat that food because it will defile what I believe in. 15 years old. That's like bringing in a bunch of 15 year olds and giving them some Krispy Kreme donuts and saying, hey, and them saying, no, no, thanks. Don't want the Krispy Kreme donuts. Probably not going to happen nowadays, right? This means yes. Most of us wouldn't say no to Krispy Kreme donuts. And so we see that happening. But Satan uses similar strategy to indoctrinate us into secular society. He uses government. He uses business. He uses media. He uses economics. He uses politics to indoctrinate us into a secular society. Doesn't mean that there are some good people in government. Doesn't mean there are some good people in business. It doesn't mean that there are some good people in, in media, that there are some good things that can come out of that. Doesn't mean that there are not some good people in economics. It doesn't mean that there are not some good people in politics. But at the core of it, just know that the enemy uses those things as a strategy to try and indoctrinate us into a secular society. And we have to be able to understand and know and with wisdom navigate the chaos that's in our, that's in our world today. It just blows my mind to think that Daniel was only 15 and he understood what was happening, attempting to happen in his life. And to the point of saying, hey, I'm not going to eat that. And trusting God enough to go to the guard and say, hey, I'm not going to eat that. But he didn't only say, I'm not going to eat it. He's like, well, hey, how about testing and see? Give us vegetables, give us water, and then see. And God began to give Daniel at the age of 15 wisdom to understand what he was doing. Daniel, for, for them to see God in Daniel... Daniel had to do things differently than what the secular world, than what the Babylonians were saying must be done. We see that also in Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So my question to you is this, what does faithfulness to God look like in our, in the secular world that we live in? What is, was it for Daniel? It was saying, hey, I'm not going to defile myself. And there's some other things as we get later on into Daniel. Daniel and the lion's den, that's going to be a whole nother story that I can't, I can't wait to um, preach through that as well. But what does faithfulness look like in a secular world? You see, God blessed Daniel because of his obedience. God blessed Daniel because he was willing to be obedient to the things that God called him to. So how do we live differently in this, in the world that we live in, the secular society that we live in? Let's look at, look, there are a couple things that we see about Daniel. I just want to point out, the first one is this, Daniel lived out what he believed in. Did he not? Daniel lived out what he believed in. Now here's my caution in that, in that phrase. My caution is be careful what you actually believe in. Right? Because what happens in our society is that the enemy comes in and again tries to indoctrinate us. That's what the king was doing. The king was taking these young guys and they were trying to indoctrinate them into what the king wanted them to be. And Daniel and his, his, his buddies were like, That's, we're, going to, we're going to do what we can, but we, we won't live by those things. And so he began to to live out what he believed in. He began to live out the biblical values, what he knew to be true. And one of those things was food, the defiling of food. Now, for us, that seems like a little thing, right? Right? Food just seems like not that big of a deal. But to Daniel, it was a pretty big deal. But I, wrote, uh, I read this, Daniel made a big deal over a little thing. He made, he made a big deal over something was little because here's what happens. What happens in our society these days is that most of the time when something goes wrong, it because it started with something small. It started with something small. It's called the slow fade. Most 
people who become addicts or become alcoholics or whatever, it doesn't just, they don't just all of a sudden drink themselves to death the very first day. It starts with one drink. It starts with one small thing. It's, it's, like, it's like marriages. <laughs> there are a lot of marriages nowadays that end up broken and in divorce because of bad choices. But most of them, listen, I've, I've been able to counsel new couples that are getting ready to, or they want to get married. And most of them, when I ask them, why do you guys want to get married? They're like, oh, because we know that we're going to cheat on each other and get a divorce. They don't say that. Because they get into the relationship thinking they want a lifetime together. And so why is it that within the first seven years, all hell seems to break loose is because one small thing tends to get in the way. And instead of pushing back the darkness in in our marriages, we let that one small thing. And most of the time, it's because you, it's called the sin of offense. Your spouse offends you. And you hold on to it, and it becomes bitterness. It becomes a root of bitterness. And when you don't deal with the small things, the small things become big things. Daniel didn't compromise even on the small, even on the small things. He lived out what he believed in. But here's what our secular society wants us to compromise on. Here's what our secular society wants us to believe in. There are three things that are probably at the top of the priority when it comes to our secular society. Power, sex, and money. Power, sex, and money. Those are the three things that if you were to look at our secular society that we live in, it's what, what the enemy is saying, hey, I want, we want, that's what we want you to buy into. Buy into this lie. That power, if you have power, that means you have control. That means you have control over people. And that's what the secular world wants. That's why we have a lot of narcissists in our society. It's because we've become power-hungry people. When we can control people, when we, can contr- when we think that we can control people and we can control things, then we can c- climb this ladder and get to a place of power and position. But what's very interesting is that that's what the secular world says, but the way the biblical view of that is that power actually comes out of a place of humility, right? Daniel humbled himself as a 15-year-old in the service of the king, but he would not, he still lived out what he believed in. And I just found this out, and I found this really interesting. One of the, we have a couple of retired pastors that are here, and they often give me some advice on, passages that I've studied or taught from and I didn't know this and he actually came up one of the former pastors came up to me afterwards and he said I don't know if you know this but those guys Daniel Shadrach Meshach and Abednego um, when they went into the service of the king they actually were castrated now can you imagine being a 15 year old and having to navigate that but now you're also telling the guard that you're not going to defile yourself I can't, I can't imagine what just emotionally Daniel is having to navigate in this. The second thing is sex. The world says, if it feels good, do it. It doesn't matter who it's with. It doesn't matter how many times. It doesn't matter how often. All those kind of things. You're like, well, Pastor Chris, you're being a little too explicit this morning. Sorry, the Bible is R-rated. It just is. And some of you are going to have to go home and have some conversation with your kids. If they're sitting in here, you probably should already be having those conversations. Sorry. Um, but our sex, sa- uh, our, our sex, our world says, you know, that. But God says that he created it as a gift 
in the context of marriage with a biological man and a biological woman. And so we start to see that the Babylonian society, because this is parallels the Babylonian society, power, sex, money, is very similar to the sec secular world that we actually live in today. Power, sex, and money. From a money side of things, the question becomes, how do you use your money to honor God? Right? The society, the secular society that we live in says, get as much as you possibly can in as fast as you possibly can in any way that you possibly can, even if you have to run over people to get it. But what God says, you see, the world says that we're, we sh says we should live extravagantly and give sufficiently. But what God says is that we actually should live sufficiently and give extravagantly. Two different, two different ways, right? Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So, as we live in a secular world, when we take on biblical values, when we take on um, living what we believe, then we actually start to do things very different than what the world does them. And the sad part is, as I think often in the church, as believers, we look too much like the world. Instead of being, holiness means being set apart from the world. It doesn't mean that we it doesn't mean that we don't hang out with sinners. <laughs> it means that we understand that in those environments we still have to live out what we believe in. Are we being shaped by biblical values? Second thing is this, Daniel would not compromise his integrity. He wouldn't compromise his integrity. He lived with integrity. We do what's right, not what keeps us out of trouble. <laughs> that, that, see, that's what the world does. The world says, you know, they take character and they take integrity and we throw it out the window. And as long as I don't get caught, then I'm going to do it. The sad part is, is that you, God will actually allow you good things to happen there are people nowadays who have a lot of money who have climbed the corporate ladder by doing a lot of wrong things but of, and, and, and God's allowed them to get to that place but eventually that world comes crashing down. And so we have to learn to live with integrity. There's, we, have to, we cannot compromise our integrity. There's no blessing in compromise. Daniel could have said, oh, I'm just going to do what the king tells me to do. I'm just going to eat the food that the king puts in front of me. I'm just going to drink the wine that the, that the king put in front of me. And Daniel said, no, I won't do that. And God, we actually see God going before him and God's blessing being on Daniel. And we're going to continue to see that throughout the book of Daniel for, as we study it over the course of the next few weeks. And so Daniel would not compromise on his integrity. I was with the kids a few years ago when we only had two kids and we were walking through the mall and there was some people in front of us and they dropped like a $10 bill and we got up to it and we picked it up and we, I looked at it and my kids looked at it and they were like, oh, let's go, let's go buy something. And I said, hold on a minute, this is not our money. And so we ran up and caught the people in front of us and tapped them on the shoulder and said, hey guys, hey guys is this your money? And they were like, oh yeah, I must have dropped it. Now, I don't know if it was or not. And that's on them. But my kids were watching and they were paying attention to how I was going to respond in a situation like that. And I hope that as my kids got older, I hope that they would do the exact same thing and that their character would outweigh anything that might challenge them to live because the secular world says let's pick it up I find it it's mine but Daniel lived a totally different way we 
we should strive to live to honor Jesus in everything. And that's what a 15-year-old, Daniel, was striving to do. And I believe if Daniel can do it, I believe that we can too. Even in the secular world that we live in, I believe that God will help us. We have to live by the scripture and not by what the culture says. We conform our heart and our life to the scripture. We, scripture becomes our guide. It becomes the very thing that we continue to go to. And what I love is that even when we've screwed up power and when we've screwed up sex and when we screwed up money, there's still the forgiveness, right? This is a prophecy about Jesus coming. Why did Jesus come? He came and he died on the cross for our forgiveness. So we we might have the hope, but he also gave us the scripture so that we might be able to live in a secular world and know how to walk in a secular world with faith and with character and with integrity and with love and with peace and with joy and with hope. But see, Satan wants to deceive us. He wants to indoctrinate us into thinking that the alternative is a whole lot more fun. It's a whole lot more prosperous. It's a whole lot more enjoyable. When in reality, the other side of things is nothing but emptiness and running after things that really at the end of the day just really won't matter. And the last thing is this, Daniel trusted in the faithfulness of God. 15 years old, he trusted when he told the guard, I won't defile myself with the food because the the guard could have easily killed him. The guard, said, well, man, if I do that, I'm going to lose my life. What did it, it, it say before that? God showed favor on Daniel. We can trust the faithfulness of God because God is always faithful. God was faithful in Dan- Daniel's journey and he will be faithful in our journey too. And so whatever it is that you may be challenged with today as it comes from living in a secular world choose to live out what you know to be true about who God is and his word choose to live with character and integrity because it's the right thing to do because it's where God's blessing actually comes from Choose to honor Jesus with everything and trust him with everything and know that he will always be faithful. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for Daniel and what his word teaches us. God, I pray that you give us the ability that in a secular world, A world that just seems to be running away from the things of God. That you'd help us to live differently. That we would be light in the dark place. We would live out what we believe in. That we would not compromise in our integrity just to get ahead. Or just to stay out of trouble. that we would honor you with every part of our life. And God, maybe even more so than anything today, would you remind us that you're faithful and that at times when we even can't see it, you're still faithful. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, you've never said yes to him, Maybe you just need to take your first small step today by saying yes to Jesus. Maybe you need to examine what you believe in. 
Are you living by the rules of the world? Are you living by the values of God? Has your character and integrity gone to the wayside? And maybe you need to make something right. Maybe there are some things in your life that you've chosen not to honor the Lord with and today you just want to make that decision. Just confess it to the Lord in this moment. God, give me a new heart. Transform me and help me to live out biblical values. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We stand with us. Let's sing this song together.